Hey everyone, and welcome to Edge Church Online. We are so glad that you have decided to join us today. It's always a beautiful day to worship our God. So if you're sitting in your living room right now, why don't you gather the family and let's stand and worship together.
all and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. Chased my heart adrift and drifted home again. Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. Time I turn around, Lord, you're still there. And I was found before I was lost, and I was yours before I was not with grace to spare for all my mistakes. this kind of love but somehow this kind of love is who you are it's a grace I can never add up to be somebody you still want but somehow you love me as you find
this kind of love But somehow This kind of love is who you are It's a grace I can never add To be somebody you still want But somehow You love me as you find Wow, how incredible is it that God loves us so much? Not later when we have it all together, when we have it all figured out, but right now. He loves you and he loves me. And because of that great love for us, he sent Jesus to pay the price for our salvation. Whatever it is that may be holding you back right now, won't you lift that before God? Join me as I pray for us. Father God, thank you that we can lift all of these things before you, Lord God. Thank you, Father, that yeah, you, you seek us, Father God. You, you search for us, Lord God. And Father God, when you find us, Lord, you do the work within us, God. You restore us to you. You restore our relationships with each other. And whatever it is that I may be carrying, God, or that anyone else may be carrying right here today, Lord God, I just pray, God, that you would do your work, God. Father, would you do a miracle work in each of our lives, Lord God. I thank you, Father God, that we don't have to have it together, but that you call us to your God, so that you can do the work in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. I love that we get to worship together and that we get to do this in person or in the comfort of our own homes. Isn't it amazing that even though you and I are not in the same building, that we can still praise God together. So here's a shout out to our tech team. You guys are amazing. We love you and we thank you for helping us make this possible. We are so excited for our child blessing, which is happening at our in-person services today. What a privilege to be able to bring your children before God and pray for this blessing over their lives. So even if you're not here in person, please say a prayer for these children and their parents. Perhaps this is your first time with us, or maybe you've popped online before, but haven't yet made contact with us. We would love to connect with you. So please say hi to us on the chat or via our WhatsApp line, which will appear on the screen below. We have a team on standby, ready to chat with you right now. Why don't you join me as we hear what Lechle has to share with us in Edge News. Hi, I'm Lechle, and I love that we're able to gather together for church. If it is your first time joining us, our heart is that you truly feel welcome today. Be sure to send us a hi on our WhatsApp number and we would love to connect with you. Edge Kids, we love that you can have Edge Kids both in person and online. This April, we'll be learning more about Jesus and our desire is for your kid to have a heart relationship with Jesus. One that they can truly get to know who Jesus is and how much he loves them. On Sunday, Edge Kids will be happening from ages 2 to grade 7. You are welcome to book a seat for your whole family. If you are online this season, you are welcome to find all your Edge Kids resources on our website. Teenagers, save this date. This Friday, the 23rd of April, we'll be getting together as a life group in person right here at the church. We'll be meeting from 7 p.m. If you're not in a life group yet, you're welcome to join us too, and you will be connected with one. DM us on Instagram if you have any more questions, and we cannot wait to hang out with you all again. Are you keen to take the next step here at Edge Church? Perhaps get baptized to join a life group or to find out your purpose and joining a serving team? Growth Track is a great opportunity to get connected to who we are as Edge Church. It happens each month of for the first three Tuesdays of the month that you can join at any time. There is also childcare available for you. We would love to walk this journey with you and take the next step with you. 
find out for more information at the Church Center app and via the website. We are here for you and we are committed to you. If you are needing for a prayer, a chat, a pastoral care or counseling, please reach out to us. We would love to journey amongst you during this journey. I'm Lithe and I hope you have a great week further. Thank you, Lichle. As a little girl, I would often hear the adults say things like, you better not test God, or I wouldn't do that if I were you. You shouldn't test God. This is biblical. An example of this is Satan is trying to tempt Jesus in the wilderness by quoting scripture in Matthew 4, verse 5 to 6. And in Matthew 4, verse 7, Jesus responds, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. You can find this in Deuteronomy 6, verse 16, and many other places in scripture where it explicitly says, do not test the Lord your God. But there is one verse where God says, test me in this. Malachi 3 verse 10 says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great, you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it, put me to the test. If I just think back on my own life, how time and time again, God has shown us his favor and come through for us at exactly the right time, there really would be too many to mention. And let me assure you, this isn't just about money. It's about your gift and what it does that attracts heaven's attention. God is pleased when his children put their trust in him and not in what they see. It often seems impossible to think that we should give of our finances when we don't even see enough in our income for ourselves, but God. He asks us to trust him fully. Go ahead, put him to the test. Thank you, Edge Church, for your faithful giving. Your generosity enables us to help others within our church, within our communities, and beyond our borders. You will see there are various ways in which you can give, and they will come up now on the screen. Let's pray for the giving. Father God, thank you, Lord, that you enable us and you equip us, Lord God, um, to be able to earn an income. I pray, God, that you would help us, Father, to see our finances, Lord God, um, as an opportunity to be a blessing to others, God. I pray now, God, for all those that have already given and that are about to give, Father. Father, would you take this, these finances, God, and multiply it, God. Multiply it, Father God, to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As a church, we love God and we love people. And so here's Daniel to share God's word on loving God and being loved by God. Well, good morning, Edge Church. It's so good to be with you today. And we missed you last week. Um, as a family, we went up to Muscle Bay. We celebrated one of our closest friends' wedding. And it was so good to be able to just get away and be with the family, going to the beach, the super tubes, forgetting our wedding outfits in Cape Town, the rock pools, cutting our feet on the rock pools, a burst tire. Doesn't it sound like a normal family holiday? But besides all of that, it was good to have a break. A short one, but it was good indeed. And over the past few weeks as a church, I've been so encouraged to see how God is working in so many of our lives. I love being able to hear some of the stories of what's happened of God encounters, support that's been there, praise being answered. And what's really encouraged me is that there's an awakening that's happening um, to God's love on people's lives. And it was, in fact, on Good Friday, after the first service, a gentleman came up to me uh, and it was, he was filled with emotions and he began to explain to me that for so many years he had heard the story of Easter. He, he knows what happened. He's been around long enough, he said to me, pretty much to see all the ways that Easter could be explained or be done. But it was on this Good Friday, and this is what caught me, he said he truly experienced God's love. And he said it was the first time in his life that he felt that he was loved by God. That wasn't just words, but he experienced and he felt that acceptance that there was no condemnation and he experienced the love of the Father. And this morning, I want to speak into that, the love of the Father. And in fact, that is the title of my sermon today. 
And it links to when I shared four weeks ago the mission of our church, how we are called to love God and love people. And I share that as time goes on, we're going to unpack this more, looking at what God's word says. Because the truth is, is that for us to be able to love God and to love people, the catalyst for us to go deeper, to stay with God, remember 1 John, is for us to know and experience the love that God has for you and I. To know that you are loved because when you know and you experience the love that God has for you, you know what happens? It leads you to being able to go to a place where you love God deeper and naturally you'll be able to love people deeper and so this is my prayer for us pray for you this morning is that you would know more than anything else today is that your heavenly father loves you and you know we see this in in Matthew 6 when Jesus is praying and he really is teaching us how to pray and Jesus says something pretty dynamic and he starts his prayer with these words listen to Matthew 6 it says our father in heaven. That very first phrase that Jesus says is our father. And it's an important phrase because he didn't just say my dad who's in heaven, hallowed be his name. No, he says our father. And Jesus is making sure that we know that for eternity, that when we pray, we're not just praying to God that is just this figure or someone out there, but we're actually praying to our father. That is the relationship status we have with our God, that he is our father. And then later on, Jesus says these words in Mark when he, when he was about to go to the cross, he says, Abba, father. You see, Abba Father is a way and it's an expression. It's a very personal way in which Jesus uses. It's a phrase like he's saying to make sure that we know that God is our personal father. Abba. Abba means dad, daddy. It's a phrase of affection. And God wants to make sure that we know that God loves us. That's the kind of relationship we have with him so that we can experience the love that God has for you and I. You hear me that there is no condemnation, no matter what you have done, where you have been. He wants us to know that we are loved. It's more than just words, but it's experience that we would feel loved. And I think for, for many of us, we, we know, we know that God loves us. Like we know the, the words and all of that. But I think we struggle to accept that we and feel loved by God. Like, I know all the sayings and stuff, and I know this, but do I really feel loved, and am I embraced by His love? And this is important, because understanding and experiencing, and I, and I said this, understanding and experiencing, knowing God loves you, is key to your success, your journey as a Christian. It is the very thing that keeps us close to God, so that we can go deep with Him, for our love for Him, and for our love for people. And the truth is, like I said, many of us struggle to understand this, to experience this love from God as our Father in heaven. Because often it's our perspective we have of God, how we view God. And I think it's because we've allowed earth to define our view of God. We have defined God from earth up instead of from heaven down. And because of this, how we have defined it is often causes uh, distortion. How we see God and we experience his love is distorted because of our view. And this often leads to a place of, of lack of clarity of who God is. And because of that distortion we have, we don't really experience that real relationship with God. And A.W. Tozer, he makes a statement, which I think is so real for where we find ourselves. Look what it says. It says, what comes into our minds when we think about God? God is the most important thing about us. Look what it says. What comes to mind when you think about God? And that is the question I want to ask you today. When you think about God, the Father, what do you think about? What is the picture that you have of Him? And there is a good chance that that picture is distorted. Because I know for myself, I've been in a place where my view of God has been distorted. And I believe many of us have that distortion because often we can see God, number one, sometimes as a puppet master. 
And I know this is, this is kind of a funny way to be able to say it, but I think it's pretty authentic to say that we see God in this way at times. That we feel like God is only interested in our performance. I have to do this and do that, and it's a distortion I've had before. Where I must earn things with God, and my relationship is completely dependent on my performance. So if I do well, then God is pleased with me. But if I don't do well, then he's not pleased with me. And that God just really wants me to be on strings like a puppet performing. And that to everyone else, you're doing well, all these things, you got it together. But actually, like a puppet, you're pretty lifeless, worn out, exhausted. But you must keep going on because you feel like God is wanting you to do that, to have you on the strings. The show must go on and you just keep putting on this pretense. The puppet master. But maybe some of us see God as a tyrant. We see God as this tyrant that he's up in the heavens and he's angry and he's got these lightning bolts and he's just wanting to strike you down and you're like, I don't know why he's even angry, but you just see him as this angry God and you think, well, so all the things that I've done, that's why he's angry. All the mistakes that I've done in this perception and I love the movie, Bruce Almighty, when the one part, Jim Carrey, yeah, you know, when he's having the terrible day, everything has gone wrong. He's lost his job. He's lost his girlfriend. And now it's a storm and he's riding and he's in an accident and he gets out of his car and he shouts out to God, smite me, oh mighty smiter. Remember that scene? And I think it's so accurate to how many of us might feel and see how God is. Feeling like you can never please God, so he might as well take you out. The third one is God is just a drifter. You sense that God is not really in the picture of your life. It just drifts in and out because you can't see him. God is just sort of there and then he's not. You, you're feeling like you can't really depend on God. God is a person we talk to when, when I really need help. I know and we sing about him and all that kind of stuff, but I might speak to him when I'm in trouble. But you know, you've seen God maybe as just he's distant. You once had it, but now it's gone. And I believe that many feel like this with God. And that your perspective of God is that there's this distance and there's this drift that you have that happens. And because there's this drift that happens, you feel like God is not interested in you. He's not interested in your life. But hear me, that's not true. He absolutely loves you. But maybe your perspective of God is that he's he's a relic. Maybe a distortion of God is because you see him as this relic that God is someone that is just handed over from past time and from generation to generation that, that is not relevant. That it, it was relevant back in the day when you were a kid and you were doing this and you were in youth groups and all of that. But as you got older, you feel like it's not real. God is just more of someone you're going to just put on a shelf and you're going to move past him, a relic. Hear me. You cannot place God on a shelf. And even if you do and you put him on the shelf, You can never move past him because there's this God-shaped hole inside of our hearts. Every single one of us have it that cannot be filled by anything else besides God. And if you try and move from God, it'll always be this wrestling match that you have, trying to find meaning, trying to find purpose for life. But God can only bring that meaning and that purpose to your life. See, these are just some of the distortions that I believe we can have of God. And why I asked you that question, what do you think about when you think about God? And maybe you have one or maybe you have all four of those distortions of God that I just spoke about. And this is the most beautiful thing about God, is that He's sovereign. And this is a great word for God because you know what it means? It means that He knows what's going on. And that God knew that we would struggle to see God clearly. That he knew that we would struggle to even experience his love. So when Jesus was on earth, you know what his mission was? He had a mission. Of course it was to go to the cross. That was part of the mission. But he was on a mission to show us the Father. That we could only see the Father through Jesus. And Jesus was showing us about the Father. And by telling us about how the Father loved. And I love about the thing about Jesus, whenever you read the accounts and when he's speaking about his father, he speaks about the love of his father. And again, I'm going to say it. We have a father 
who loves you so much. And Jesus is wanting us to point us in the direction because he knew that we would struggle with these distortions. He knew that this would be a thing that we struggle with. And the good news today is that you can change your perspective of who the Father is and you can see him clearly. And I'm telling you now, hear me, once you change that perspective, you will experience the real love a Father has for you. And it will leave you with a deeper, more dynamic relationship with Him that will lead you to listen, to love God and love people more because you know that you are loved and that is key. And I think one of the greatest chapters that shows the love of the Father is Luke 15, when Jesus tells us about the three parables. He talks about the lost sheep and, and how Jesus will leave the 99 just to come find the one, you and I. Then he talks about the lost coin, showing how God is always thinking about us, always on his mind. And then he speaks about the lost son. And how Jesus paints this picture of the story of a father waiting so desperately for his son to come home. And the boy gets his inheritance early and he goes off and he wastes it and he's wild living. And, and then eventually the son comes home and the father's waiting for him to come home, to love him, to show how much he is loved. And that's a parable I want to share with you today. And I shared it with us four weeks ago, but just briefly, when we spoke about the house of love. And I use the story, but today I want to take it a little bit more deeper as we unpack love God and love people. Because in this parable, there are four pictures that Jesus gives us of the love of a father. And if you ever want to see a clearer picture of the father, look no further than the prodigal son. And I want to share those four pictures with us today so we can have that perspective change. And we read it in Luke 15. And I'm just going to read certain portions of the scripture. And it says, the younger son once said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Now, now you must know that when Jesus is telling this story, this context here, he's telling it to a Jewish audience. So the story carries more weight than maybe what our perspective of it is today. But, but just if think about it, even for us today, Think about it. This would be such a big scandal. If you knew someone saying to their father, to their dad, uh, um, you're not dead yet, but I want my inheritance. Basically, what you're saying is that I wish you were dead so I can get my stuff. So now for the Jewish audience that Jesus is telling us, they would have been in shock hearing this. It's so rude. It's unconventional. And Jesus starts a story with this. And the first picture we see of the father is the father starting the story by saying yes. Yes to the son's unconventional request, which leads to the question, why would the father say yes to this kind of request? See, we, of course, we don't know the backstory. Uh, we can just imagine and just imagine what was happening in that family, all the different dynamics that was going on that led to this request. There must have been serious relationship breakdown where the father and the son would have had a strained relationship breakdown in this place. The fact that a son would request that he's saying, Dad, I basically want you dead so I can have my inheritance and then leave home. Why would the father still have said yes to this request? And this is the first picture that we see of God that I want to see us. That number one, a father loves relationally. You see, the father was, he was unwilling to force the son to stay. And the father in the story is the same as a father in heaven. He stands for relationship only. He will not force you. He will not control you. He's not interested in that. He is only interested in a real relationship with you. And even though that the dad knew it wasn't the best thing for his son to leave, in that moment, he knew the only way he could ever have this relationship again was to allow for his son to do what he wanted to do. And knowing he would be standing waiting for him, knowing that pain would still come his way. But still the father stood for the relationship. And this is such a beautiful picture of God. And I, I remember myself as a kid being so angry at my parents, thinking literally that they hated me because I wasn't allowed to compete in swimming competitions or train on a Sunday. I legit thought they hated me. When you're a kid, you think weird things. 
And now being a parent <laughs> and also a pastor, I see their motives that they actually they wanted the best for me. That my relationship with God and also just thinking, how is it even possible? They work on a Sunday. How are they going to train me? But anyway, as a kid, you don't think like that. But hear me. They had good motives, even though I couldn't see it. God always has the best for us, which is a relationship with Him. You see, God's motives are good. God is perfect. Even when we don't understand Him, He's still perfect. And maybe you feel like God even hates you or He's mad at you and you, you don't want anything to do with Him and He doesn't want anything to do with you. But we read in Luke 15 that He loves. And we need to know this, that we can trust God's motivation, His motives. Because the thing is, God's motivation is always about relationships. That he's always wanting a relationship with us. And this is the thing. It was not God that broke the relationship with us. It was, it was you and I. We were the ones that walked away. And every single Sunday, we take this opportunity at the end of the service to connect and pray with you. For you to be able to have that connection, a relational connection with your father, not a religious, a relational connection where you can have a connection, hear me, where you can come home. And at the end of this time online, I want to do the same prayer again where you can make that decision. You see, because this is what happened with the son. He came home where he eventually came to his senses and he knows he has to go home. And so he, he preps the speech to tell his dad, and we read it in verse 20. So he got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, throwing his arms around him and kissed him. And again, when you read this, you need to understand the context of what is happening here. For the Jewish audience, firstly in Jewish times, listen, no Middle Eastern man would run for any reason. It was considered embarrassing. It was considered undignified. I really relate to this because I feel the exact same still to this day. I think it's undignified to run. And if you ever see me running, there's either a problem or someone is chasing me, so get help. But in the Jewish culture, no man would run for any reason. That's the first thing. But secondly, the context that we read is that the son deserved punishment, not em embracing from his dad. And there was a Jewish culture where you would be punished in front of the whole community. That they would take you and they would, in fact, they would break a pot at your feet. And everyone around you would make comments and insults and condemn you. And they would say the things that you did wrong. And ultimately, they would cast you out of the community. So when the father ran, he didn't care about the embarrassment for himself. He did it so that no one else in the community would get to his son first. Be the first one to throw the stone. Be the first one to say a word. He came to be the first one to embrace his son and protect him. You know, our Heavenly Father does the exact same thing for us today. Why? Because number two, our Father loves sacrificially. You see, God paid it all for you and I. No greater way of showing His love by sending His Son. And we celebrated this over Easter. That God has done everything He can for you and me. And it was out of a sacrificial way in every way because he took on all the punishment we deserve so that we could come into a relationship with him. Our father loves us sacrificially. And this verse gets to me every time. Romans 5, it says, it says, but God showed his great love for us. How? By sending Christ to die for us. Take note. While we were still sinners not when we had it all together when things were perfect we were doing the right things but he came while we were still sinners we were messed up doing all the wrong things God sacrificed for you and I and he proves his love for you and me and of course the enemy wants to come and distort our view. He doesn't want you to know this. He wants you to think of a different kind of relationship. He doesn't want you to live in that place of freedom. He wants you to carry the guilt and you're not good enough and the shame and the distorted views. And, and God says, I want to come take all that condemnation. So why? 
so that we can truly live without condemnation. It's because of his sacrificial love for you and I that we can live in this place of freedom. Hear me? God will use your story, what you have done, the mistakes that you have made. He will use it for his good. He will not condemn you. He will forgive you. And you know what he says? You can come home to him free and live with him. And we see in the next picture of God when how the son has this, he has a speech ready. He's going to present it to his dad. He's going to tell his father all these things in verse 21. And so the father said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And before he goes any further, before the son can say another thing, because we know that the son was going to suggest, because we read it further up in the portion of scripture, that he was going to say, I don't deserve to be a son, but I'd rather just be a servant in your house because he knows he doesn't deserve it. The father interrupts and says, and listen, he does something so extravagant in verse 22. He says this, but the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Which leads me to number three. Our father loves extravagantly. You see, we have a Father in heaven that loves us extravagantly. He doesn't just love me just enough or with terms or conditions. He loves us over the top. He loves you more than you can ever imagine. And I've said this and I'll keep on saying, if God had a phone, you would be a screensaver. You would be the profile picture that he would have. And we see this in the story of the prodigal. When the father gives the son, he gives him a robe and sandals and rings. And these are extravagant gifts. And you think to me, what's so extravagant about a robe and pluckies? Listen to me. There's context again with the meaning of each of these gifts. These are legacy gifts, heirs that is given to the son. You see, the robe was given to the son, represented the righteousness of Christ that would cover him. A covering. And the ring it was a significant ring. You see, because the ring would carry the father's authority, his name on it. And the sandals, as a slave in a foreign country, which his son was, they would take away your sandals so that you wouldn't be able to escape, that he had no freedom. And now the father comes and he gives him sandals so that he would be free. Extravagant gifts. And you know what? The son didn't even deserve it. He didn't deserve it for what he did. And hear me, these are the same gifts our Heavenly Father wants to give you and more. You see, God desires to give you so much more. And so often we can get caught up in the simple things of lives. And God is just saying, will you go all in? There's so much more that I want to be able to give you that you're currently experiencing. Hear me. God wants us to increase our expectation. And we can increase our expectation because he's the God of the more. He's extravagant. He's not here just calling us to just settle, that this is just enough. He's saying there's more that he wants to give you. Will you live in that place of freedom? But lastly, another picture we see is when we see the other character in the story, because in fact, there's in the older son. And I only want to share the one part with us, but there, there's more about the older son, and I encourage you to go read this in Luke 15. But the older son is so angry. He's cross with what's happened, feeling that it's not fair. See, because it's a religious spirit. Because the religious are always offended by the love of the Father. Because it cannot be earned. It can only be received. And so the oldest son is offended and the father says these words to him in the last um, verse in 31. He says, my son, talking to the older boy, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Why? Because this brother of yours was dead and he is now alive again. He was lost and now is found. Church, hear me. It's so easy to focus on the here and now and just 
focus on myself and trying to survive another day and just get through this. I'm just hanging on until I get to the holidays. I'm just hanging on until I get to the term ends. And it's so easy to get caught up and focusing on the now and we don't see the bigger picture that God has in mind because it always becomes about us. Because number four, our Father loves eternity. You see, this is a big deal with God is that He loves you enough that He wants to spend eternity with you, to have that relationship with you. And when the day comes when we are no longer alive here on earth, that we would be alive forever with Him in heaven. And I know that as a church, each church, we are a house of love, that prodigals would come home and I speak it over at our church, that we would never become like the older brother where we lose our focus and we only focus on the now we forget eternity that we would know and that our church would have a reputation as a church that loved well that we love God well and that we love people regardless of what we have done or where you have been that there is a message that is evident in our lives and as a church that we are loved that we are loved by God and so we love others eternity mindset and it starts when we know that we are truly loved. It starts when our perspective of God is the one of love. And we know this verse well. John 3, 16, it says, For this is how God loved the world, that He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone, everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. See, God wants us to know our destination, knowing where we are going, living our lives with that direction and purpose. And so today I want to pray for you and I, and I encourage you now where you find yourself, just to put everything down and maybe there's distractions and things happening, and I get that. But I want to trust that right now in this moment that God is going to speak to you because there's two groups of people I want to pray for today. Firstly, I want to pray for those who identify going through this message that, that your view of God has been distorted and that you don't feel the love of God for you. My prayer is that right now, wherever you find yourself, that you would just feel the love of God being poured over you. That you would experience his love right now upon you and I'm praying that there would be clarity that in this moment it doesn't matter what your thoughts have been your distortion your hurts your views that today it would change and your perspective of our Heavenly Father would be clear so that you would have this clarity so that your heart would be open to God, that God is showing you through the prodigal son that he loves you. And then secondly, I want to pray for those who identify with the prodigal son, who have walked away, who have wandered, who have lost from God, that today as you heard this message, that you would come to your senses like the son did, and that you would make a decision to come home, you know what the most beautiful thing is? That you can. Just like the prodigal son, when he came around and he was like, I need to go home. But you can do the exact same. And the most beautiful picture is that your heavenly father stands there waiting for you to come home. And all you have to do, you don't have to prepare a speech. You don't have to try and present facts. All you have to do is say, I admit that I need God. I believe and that I confess that He is Lord of my life. So right now, if you want to make that decision to come home, I want you to say this prayer with me where you find yourself. Dear God, today I admit that I have wondered, that I'm lost, that I don't have my life together, and that I'm not living the way you always wanted me to live. I can feel that there's a hole, that there's something missing in my life. But today, I believe in you. I believe that you came and you did the greatest sacrifice to save me. So on this day, I confess 
that you are Lord in my life, that on this day, I give my life to you and say those words, I give my life to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, I wanna encourage you, if you made that decision, that you'll let us know, please, we would love to be able to join you. We spoke about the relational God. We want to be able to have a relationship with you and you can indicate right now by pressing the button on the church online or you can go via WhatsApp and you can connect. Our team would love to be able to have a connection with you and be able to give something to you as you go on this journey. But God bless church. It's been so good being with you and we'll see you next week. Wow, such an encouraging word from Pastor Daniel. We have come to the end of our service and I love being here with you today. I'd like to pray a blessing over you as you go into your week. May the God of peace who raised Christ from the dead strengthen your inner being for every good work. And may the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon you and dwell within you this day and evermore. Amen. See you next week. We'll be breaking bread together. Bye.